Hey everyone, this is Mario Dennis, your host for the Keeping It Real Estate podcast. And today, my dear friend and fellow realtor at Prefer Real Estate Brokers, Anthony Bertram. Anthony, how are you? Hey y'all, I'm good. I'm good. How about yourself, Mario? Good, man. I'm so happy that we're doing this um, for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. First, you inspire me to stock up my bar at the office because, <laughs> like, I, you know, the last episode was. Uh, my first episode in this set of the one that I did with Dan. Mm -hmm. And so before I used to do this in my house, I had a, you know, like one of the detached mother-in-law suites above the garage. Mm -hmm. And it's literally a full bar that I had in there. Mm -hmm. um, so, but here in the office, I didn't have anything, you know? So with Dan, I felt a little inadequate that all I can offer him is like a glass of water. <laughs> you and need alcohol when you're recording podcasts. It's just, it just allows the conversation I think, to flow. I think so. And yeah. so... I asked you today what your drink of choice was. You told me Henny and Ginger. Yes. And so here we are. And cheers, man. Cheers. <laughs> by, by the way, way I, I've never had this before. So. How does it taste? Hennessy Privilege, by the way, he bought Hennessy Privilege, not the regular Hennessy. And oh, it's that's much good. smoother. And it tastes amazing by itself. That is so Neat. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Glad you glad you suggested that. So um, if you are a future guest on the podcast, we have a fully stocked bar <laughs> yes, on does. the works. Um <laughs> How you been, man? I've been great, man. I've been great. Uh, coronavirus has been kind to us realtors. Uh, I know in the beginning we were kind of thinking like, oh, my God, the, the world is going to end and, you know, the sky is going to fall. We're not going to sell anything else. What the hell is what are we going to do? And mm -hmm. it's actually ended up being one of the best years uh, that I've seen in my seven years of real estate. So it's been great. Yeah. And a, a lot of that, I think, has to do with the market. Right. But. Mm -hmm. Part of it also has to do with being able to lock in on what you're doing a little bit more because yeah. we have less distractions with coronavirus because there's not an invitation for a happy hour every week and yeah. there is and all these other social events that are taking place on for real estate agents every day if you choose to there is an event yeah. there's a happy hour there's a class there's something to go to mm -hmm. and i feel like coronavirus kind of put the lid on that mm -hmm. no there's not a lot of this live events yeah and it allows you to lock in a little bit better. Yeah, actually, a lot of people are um, home, too. So social mm -hmm. media has been a great avenue. This is where we're getting most of our information from, and you really don't have any distractions. So I've been using social media as a uh, platform to get business, and, you know, I'm able to really connect with the consumer now and to get them to get off the fence, uh, especially with the help of these interest rates and this low inventory. Uh, it's been great. So, yeah. Yeah, you're one of those guys that in social media, I feel like you're magnetizing to a lot of people, right? Like, mm. that's a lot of how you do your business. Yeah. People see you in social media. You're one of the people that comes through in social media. It's like people that have never met you will be like, oh, that's my friend Anthony. Yeah, yeah, Just yeah. Just because you, you are very candid. You post a lot. You have a lot of stories, about, you know, of your day-to-day, -day, yeah. you know, not just a scripted, like, three-minute video. It's like, hi, this is Anthony Bertram. If you're looking to buy or sell real estate, give me a call to, you know. Right. People become mute to that. I've learned over the years is just, you know, to be myself. This is a people business, and people like to do business with people they like. Mm -hmm. And when you're authentic, it allows people to really build a connection with you. Um, on top of that, I'm very engaging. So mm -hmm. even if I have people I've never met before, half of my followers I've never met before, but uh, I communicate with them. I know about their family, everything, um, and they know about my life too. So it's calls for me to build like a great community um, that just goes ahead and feeds my business and support me in anything that I, I need, to be honest with you. I can go to my followers and be like, hey, I need to find Class Azul. Can you guys find it for me? Yeah. And in 30 minutes, boom, somebody has found it. So, yeah, it's great. That's awesome. How did you get into real estate? Oh, so I got into real estate uh, when I was in high school. My aunt actually took over and, you know, kind of helped me finish my last junior and senior year in high school. And she was a real estate agent. Mm -hmm. And, uh, man, I idolized my aunt. The way she was able to just become this powerful businesswoman when the phone rang and when she was handing her deals I, I'd never seen anything like it growing up and I wanted to do it straight out of high school. Uh, this I graduated high school in 2006. Mm -hmm. So I went to my Gallus counselor. And I was like, you know, I got to step into UCF, but I'm going to, I'm going to do real estate on the side. And she's like, listen, now real estate is booming, but you know, you can't do both. So you're going to have to pick one. Thank God I picked to go ahead and do my, I'll uh, get my degree because the real estate market crashed, crashed a, year a couple so of years later. later. Yeah. And it was just like, uh, so I forgot about it, man. And then um, I was hanging out with some friends uh, after I graduated, I was hanging, we were vacationing. All of them had some type of like entrepreneurial sales job and their lifestyle was just so flexible. They were, they were so in charge of their lives. And I was working in the medical sales company and 
in the operations por- portion. So I wasn't out in the field. I was mm-hmm. in the office at a desk. That's hard to picture. You're such a social guy. Right. Um, <laughs> it's funny. Like That's one thing that I always liked about you from when I first met you. Because even though we're both in Prefer, we, we're in different offices. Yeah. So like we're flying different ships most of the time. But I would run into you, and it was never small talk. Mm-hmm. It's never, hey, how you doing? Great. How are you? Okay, perfect. And you move on. Like, it's always a conversation. And I like it because I hate small talk. Yeah. I'm terrible at it. You know, I'm the guy that people are like, hey, how are you? And I'm like, good. <laughs> and I just, like, sit there What's in this? silence, yeah. you know, because I like engaging conversation, hence the podcast. But right. uh, h- hard to picture you locked in an office and not out in the field. Man, it was hard, too, to be honest with you. I got in trouble a lot. Uh, they told me, like, you need to stay at your desk. And I just... I was constantly at other people's desks just having a conversation. And um, I was a sales admin. So I was the admin to the top salespeople in our company. And my ability to upsell our customers was just, I I think people really noticed it and uh, took advantage of it. So I just sat down one day and I was like, man, I need to go back to the drawing board. What is it that I wanted to do? Because this is not fulfilling to me. I hate it. I hate clocking in. I hate being on this whole uh, schedule with somebody else's rules. Like, what is it I want to do? And real estate popped up. Went ahead, got my real estate license a couple of months later, got my first listing, which led me to be on House Hunters. And then it was just like, you know, it, it was history from then. So, yeah. That's pretty awesome. Um, did you grow up in Central Florida? No, I actually grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, okay. Yes. So, yes. But you are a native Floridian. I am, yes. And yes. then I assume UCF got you to Central Florida? Yes, it did. It and did. then you stayed. I fell in love, uh, you know. Orlando is different from Jacksonville. Yeah. It's, it's, it was a culture shock to me to move here and see so many different cultures just in, in just in one area mm-hmm. um, compared to Jacksonville, to be honest with you. It was just black and white. That's mm-hmm. what I was used to. But coming able to see Caribbean people, people from all over around the world here in Central Florida, I just really fell in love. And then I got into real estate and just ended up staying. Um, once I graduated, I've noticed that all my friends started to slowly moved away, move yeah. away. And it's like, I'm here now. And I'm just like, now it's at the point where I'm kind of by myself. Mm-hmm. I miss all my friends. My friends live in D.C., New York. They moved to these big Oh, colleges. they'll move back. If they're in New York, they'll move back. They are actually, <laughs> yes. I tell you, know, I've noticed that a lot of people are starting to move back down south for a number of reasons. So, so I'm actually happy that I'm here now because I'm starting to reap the benefits of these people moving back. Yeah, that's one thing in real estate. You know, people, um, that happens to me, I've had clients that move out of town and I help them sell their house. And then four years later that something brings them back. Yes. And I think one thing with Florida that is undeniable about COVID is it's attracted a lot of people from big cities because Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're in a $5 million Manhattan, you know, condo, that's still a 2,500 square foot condo. And if you're locked in there, that is a uh, you that that'll get old quickly versus you you know you see your friends that spend the same amount of money in Windermere yes. and they have 6000 square feet they have a pool a tennis court and you're in New York and you're like what the heck man I don't want to do this. I want to go to Florida. I want to be in the sun. I want to be outside. I want to be able to run. I want to be able to barbecue, you know? That's exactly what's happening. I just had a client that moved down from Harlem. Um, He's a doctor, and he moved down to Winter Garden. And it was like, man, the amount of space and, um, you know, the the amount of amenities that we can get for this money compared to New York is crazy. They were afraid of the, uh, of just the the Florida, uh, I wouldn't say atmosphere just because how we're portrayed in the media, mm-hmm. you know, Florida just has this, this bad, uh, rep. Florida man. Exactly. We're crazy. You know, the things that we do, we alligators can't everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody keeps asking about alligators or just this crazy, weird, uh, you know, uh, I want to say they, they think that we're really, really, uh, conservative. And sometimes like we're like a red net state. And I'm just like, you know, Florida's very diverse. It depends on where in Florida, central Florida. We're very liberal. You yeah. know, uh, we're, we're, like I said, a melting pot. But if you go to some backwood, you know, cities and stuff like that, you might experience that. But, you know. You yeah. Know. Yeah. I think um, Florida is a very misunderstood state by right. a lot of people. And because it all it can literally be it's so big that you can section different states out of Florida. Mm-hmm. Like South Florida is its own thing. Man. Like South Florida is so different than the rest of the nation. It is. Um and then you go up a little bit and you have a space where there's really not a whole lot of population. Then you get to, you know, the I-4 corridor, Central Florida, and people are like, wow, this is interesting because you have a lot of Latin people, but the majority of the Latin people in Central Florida 
or Puerto Rican versus South Florida, which is a melting pot, mostly Cubans Cuba. and South yeah. America and Central American. So it, it's Central Florida is very unique in character, but then Central Florida also attracts a lot of people from all over the world because of the parks. Yeah. You know, you have people in student programs from China, Europe or whatever that stayed here mm -hmm. or they're making a living here. And so for me, it was the same when I first came to Orlando to for work it was 2005 mm -hmm. and I fell in love with it right away because it was like, oh my goodness, like there's all this culture, all these people, all these restaurants I saw come up. I love food. Man, so yes, all we the, have you great know, food. We have amazing food. I mean, I, I, I've had good food in other places, but not as close together as here, you yeah. know, like it was to me, that was really appealing and, and it's better now than it's ever been. It is, you know, I'm kind of spoiled when it comes to central Florida uh, and I travel to other places because we have great shopping, you know, great food, great entertainment. It is really a place for anyone. It just, it and in a very small space, all in of a it. Very small space. Right. So, and like I said, the cost of living is great too. So compared to other cities, I, you know, I scratch my head sometimes, like, why didn't I move? And I, and I realize I'm spoiled here. Mm -hmm. You know, this is home. It feels like home. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a great place for millennials too. You know, a lot of us are starting to have kids and stuff now and make families. It's a great place to raise your family. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it does the other thing. South Central Florida for the longest time had the stigma of being just a vacation destination spot. And I think one thing that that's happened in Central Florida that's worked really well with like, um, you know, Lockheed Martin and some of this bigger Amazon distribution mm -hmm. centers and whatnot is that it's not only a vacation destination, it is an industry powerhouse, not just hospitality, but we, we are doing other things. There's technology companies coming in town to, um, to understand, to rip the benefits of being in an area that has great weather, that has great schools, that has great, um, affordability and, and, you know, the place is just continues to boom, even through a pandemic with, even a, through a pandemic. with our two largest employers shut down is right. still booming. It's incredible. And I was so scared about that because I'm like, oh my God, tourism is our main source of income. Sure. And that was the thing that was really affected. But to be honest with you, I haven't seen, uh, too much, uh, I haven't seen too much, of. Uh, people really suffering or uh, in a, in a distressed environment here in central Florida, which is kind of weird um, to be honest with you. Yeah. And, and there is, I mean, I'm sure there's people that are having a rough time yes. um, with that said, uh, you know, you're right. If this would have happened 10 years ago in central Florida, it would have been a mass exodus. It would have been Katie barred the door where everybody's out of here. Right. Because you would have had the two largest employers shut down. You would have all this massive loss of income. You wouldn't have had any other industry in town to kind of survive. But what we, uh, what we're experiencing is very different than that. I'm sure again, there's people, especially those, those people that got furloughed at the park. There's mm -hmm. the hourly employees that work the parks um, and the hotels, the hospitality industry, the, you know, Evidently, those people are getting hurt. But mm -hmm. as a as a collective, the entire Central Florida area, I think we are extremely fortunate to be in the position we're in right now. What do you think is going to happen with our market in the next year? What do you think we're going to look like August twenty twenty one? Well, you know, it's it's difficult. It's difficult to predict because the year two thousand twenty has had so far about a decade worth of events take place on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're still also in a presidential election, which I think that can tip whatever, you know, however things are going to go in many yeah. respects. But with that said, you know, I think a lot, couple of things happened with COVID. You have a, at least 50% of the kids right now being homeschooled mm -hmm. or um, school from home, or, you know, however, you know, the virtual ed thing. Uh, but for those people, I think, you're not longer having to live in a zip code just because it has a good school. Yeah. Um, you are able to um, live where you truly desire to live because no, the, the zip code and the school association is no longer important when you're doing more homeschooling. Mm -hmm. If you work from home, well, that commute is no longer important. Mm -hmm. You know, being 25 minutes from downtown Orlando, it's no longer important. And, for us, we don't see it as much because we have so many things close to us. But if you live, um, let's call it New York, Maine, Ohio, wherever, in an area that doesn't have, you know, Walt Disney World parks, it doesn't have Universal Studios, it doesn't have a beach nearby, mm -hmm. and you can work from home and your kid's being homeschooled, 
why on earth would you stay in an area that doesn't have good weather most of the year, yep. that doesn't have uh, the best of safety records um, in a house that probably is pretty old and pretty small in square footage and outdated when you can go to Florida, spend the same amount of money, have a brand new house, be five minutes away from Walt Disney World Parks where you can go more often because you work from home and your kids homeschool. Right. Um, so I think no matter how I see it, I, I think Florida continues to um, improve and outperform a lot of the country because it's a desirable place to live. Mm -hmm. And I think people are going to be choosing where to live in the future, mostly by where they want to be mm -hmm. without any other strings attached. I like that. And I, I totally agree with you. I know that I've been hearing reports of, uh, you know, some popular people such as Susie Orman telling people, oh, you know, wait before you sell your house or wait before you actually buy a home because foreclosures are actually going to start coming down uh, due to this forbearance issues that, uh, that, the, that banks are giving out and uh, you know, people losing their jobs and everything. And I haven't seen a slowdown yet. Um, and I really don't think that those that are affected uh, when it comes to their jobs are the ones that we have to worry about. The ones that are able to work from home have a higher income and are able to keep things up. On the flip end, though, I have a client that's a doctor uh, that works in the emergency room and his hours was cut because, sure. you know, n not a lot of people are coming into the emergency room. Right. And I, for one, I didn't know that doctors get paid hourly. I just yeah. really thought you were just rich. Just <laughs> like, you know, I thought you got this big ass salary. And But, yeah, he came to me. And he was like, yeah, man, my hours are cut. And it's just like, Ew. you know, I can afford things, but I don't know for how long. So. I'm just sitting back. I'm, I'm looking. I'm paying attention. And just, you know, however the market is going to change, I'm going to change with it. You know, I got into the market when we were in a heap of foreclosures and short sales. And, you know, businesses and uh, agents was able to thrive throughout that, that time, too. Yeah, so. I think the only constant in our market is change. Change mm -hmm. is inevitable. It always happens. Um, mm -hmm. You have to be able to adapt to it, but you also have to be... Um, have sort of the fortitude to not jump the gun and um by the way if you hear a little background noise it's storming outside like if there was a monsoon yeah. so that's what you're hearing it's florida <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but but you know with that said i think um i i think you know some agents sometimes make the mistake of trying to jump the gun too quick and oh you know COVID's here, you know, like mm -hmm. we have to implement all these changes. Like sometimes you, we got to, you know, ease into it to see really um, how things stabilize a little bit. I mean, the Suze Orman one was, that was hysterical to me to yeah. read. Someone that calls themselves a financial advisor, by the way, no qualifications whatsoever, no schooling whatsoever. She's done nothing right. that qualifies her for this title, except writing some pretty catchy books. But she's telling people, I would not advise you to buy a house right now. Well, you know what? In Florida, if people bought a house when she says she wouldn't advise to it, they probably would already have 1% or 2% equity built into yes. it. Because we've seen that over the last five months, which is when she said that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of like the anti-guru. I don't, I, I don't see any of those people generally out there trying to help people. They're just helping their bottom line, helping yeah. their base, trying to get those clicks. It's like the media. It's all... You know, when you create a system, which is what we have right now, I of people getting paper clicks, mm -hmm. the net result is whether it's the media, whether it's the gurus, whether it's anyone, you know, even real estate agents, they come up with the catchiest headline with the click, the, the thing that would be is the most clickbaity possible mm -hmm. because people will click on that and then they get their, their revenue for that, for that click. Right. And the problem, you know, with the media is even worse because they get the revenue. And even if the story is false and they have to retract it later, they still get to keep that revenue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it's just a really terrible system of communicating in social media and, and, and generally speaking for, for discerning news. Yeah, we, we, we live in an age where everybody has a platform and they can put whatever information they want out there and it, it becomes dangerous, right? Yeah. Compared to back in the 90s and stuff like only qualified people really... I wouldn't say only qualified people, but usually people that has a reputation um, of giving out good good information can go out and, and spread information, and it'll be good. Um, m I will be honest with you. When COVID first happened, my whole thing was, okay, I have to service my clients. What should I advise them? I do a, a gym drop uh, yeah. video series where I try to educate the public about different things in real estate. Mm -hmm. And 
I honestly didn't know what to do, but the most logical thing for me was to say like, Hey, you know, you guys, while the market is still, you know, at this height, go ahead and pull out your money, reinvest into another, uh, you know, into another home and go ahead and invest that, that the rest of your equity into something else. Right. Yeah. So, because we don't know what the market is going to do. And I thought it would be a disservice if I didn't advise them to do that. I later found out shortly found out like, Hey, that's not actually the case. And you know, I calmed down on that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, didn't and it wasn't like a fear holy shit but imagine that you reconsider an idea Mm -hmm. that's like huge no one does that right now right people are married to their ideas they are there no one wants to be wrong people want to be right more than they want to be helpful and that's a real problem that is so crazy to me right it's like we grow from like making mistakes and actually learn that's that's what we are about as humans so yeah, man, if I, I'm, I'm the first to admit sometimes when I make a mistake and it's like, okay, or if I was so set in the ideal and someone came to me and showed me something differently and if it made sense, okay, cool. I see it and I'll go with it. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I never, especially in this business, as you said, real estate is all about change. That's the only constant thing. So I, you, you get some agents that have been doing this for 30 to 40, 50 years. And if they have chosen to be the exact same way, they wouldn't be able to thrive in this real estate market compared to in the seventies or the sixties. So you have to be a agent that is not set in your ideas, constantly looking. Yeah. I mean, and I, I I think that's important for real estate agents, but it's it's important as humans. Yeah, man. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that's dangerous with humans, I think is that we are, we're wired biologically to be tribalistic. You know, we're tribal people, man. You know, you can go back 10,000 years, 100,000 years. We arranged ourselves in tribes. And when the other tribe came over, it was like generally one of the two tribes was going to end up fucked up. Like it wasn't very amicable, you know, like it's um, even, you know, you read history. I read history of Native Americans, you know, like Mm -hmm. the Comanche were ruthless Mm -hmm. so much so that that's why the Apache end up doing a pact with the Europeans when the Europeans show up and say, hey, man, can you guys help us defeat these guys? Because the Comanches have fucked every tribe over. They've just pushed everyone out of the West in the United States. Mm-hmm. So that same instinct that, that drove that conflict thousands of years ago still drives people today. Yeah. And so whether it's in real estate because people are set in their ways and they're not interested in change or they want to use fear mongering you know, to try to get business, as humans, we have to be better about not being as tri- uh, as tribal and being able to be open to examine a new evidence, yes. you know, and be like, yes. you know, I had this idea, but, you know, considering this new thing that I just found out about, it was probably a shit idea. You know, like I do that with conspiracy theories all the time because I'm like, I, I'm drawn to conspiracy theories, but then I read about them and I'm like, gosh, oh, <laughs> shit, that one was crap too, you know? And then I go I to the next one clear. and I'm like, <laughs> and then, I, you know, the next one comes up and cause they're sexy, right? Yeah. Like conspiracy theories generally have something about them that's magnetizing and you're like, oh shit, let me, <laughs> And then you're, and then I read about it. I'm like, oh no, this is crap. Like, th- is it this whole 5G thing as that was going around during Corona? Like, oh, Corona was created due, due oh, yeah. to this whole 5G towers and even celebrities that didn't have didn't even graduate high school, let alone to get a, a degree in science to go ahead and give uh you know their opinion about these things. It's it's funny that you say this because during this time, especially during COVID, you know, a lot of racial tension has been um, happening and. Um, a lot of, uh, especially when it comes to this whole black life matter, black lives matter movement. And I think this has been the time, like I told you in the beginning of the episode where people are stuck at were stuck at home and they were on their phones sure. on social media and they actually had to pay attention to what was going on in the world. And, uh, you know, it was a great time. I did a, uh, gym drop about, I, I was, one day I was at, at the office and I was like, okay, I need to come up with a gym drop. What am I going to talk about? And this was right after George Floyd, uh, uh, you know, lost his life. And it was just like, man, I can't think of anything else but George Floyd. And I went ahead and just said, you know what? I'm going to talk about my experience being an African-American mm-hmm. in, uh, in the real estate field. And I'm just going to, you know, come off the, off the top of my head, no scripts or anything like that. Just really speaking from my experience. And um, after I made the video, I was like, okay, cool. Now, I thought about it. And I talked about it with friends and everything like that before I posted it, you know, and I and after I, you know, really paid it pay attention to what I actually created. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and just put it out there. So I put it out there on all the platforms that I was a part of when it came to the real estate community on, on top of my own own platform. Mm-hmm. And 
the results was kind of like shocking to me in a sense because for one, I didn't expect a lot of support, which I did get, but then the pushback that I got from my experience from other people that was just so, they were so, they were so stuck in their ways and stuck on how things have been going for them that they refuse to look at it from another person's perspective mm-hmm. or even recognize and acknowledge that this is actually happened, um, happening. So, uh, yeah, man, sometimes us as humans, uh, we, like you said, we are so stuck in our ideas and things that have been going on for so long. And it's just like that doesn't necessarily mean it's right or it's not happening. And yeah. you need to pay attention. One hundred percent. And, you know, that, that video that you made. And it's interesting because since you're in the brokerage, people talk to me about it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, the first thing that I noticed is not scripted. Yeah. So the first thing that I would say to people is. Well, how about you go and script it and give your thoughts on this? Oh, no, I can't do that. Well, that's the first problem, right? Right. You know, it's like I've been caught on the podcast before. I've been told in the podcast before in certain episodes, like, you know, that thing that you said was offensive. And I'm like, well, fuck, yeah, I've done 50 <laughs> episodes over an hour a piece. I'm sure there's yeah. some in there. I mean, I don't mean to be offensive to anyone. Like, right. when if, if I'm offensive at any point, it's not because I'm trying to do that thing. I'm trying to have a conversation. Yeah. You know, so, um, and, and the thing is you're specific when you did that video, there was something you said in the video, like there was some things that I necessarily don't see eye to eye. There's some things that were incredible eye opener. So when Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that when you were in real estate school and Mm -hmm. they ask, you know, who owns a house or who's had a family that that's owned a house before you were the only person that didn't raise their hand. And I'm like, fuck yeah. And so now I get like deep into this whole redlining issue that was around all the way into the seventies in the yeah. United States. And I'm like, Oh, I can see why this, mm-hmm. this is a real problem. It's a, it's a, it's a problem that happened then mm-hmm. and certainly has improved. So there's no one saying that it hasn't improved since then, but for fuck's sakes do not acknowledge that this really happened within our lifetime really i mean you're younger than me but i mean still almost within our lifetime that's that that's that's to me the part that's crazy because like you said people should be able to examine this new evidence or if they were never exposed to it like listen there's no shame on that yeah there if you didn't know what juneteenth was and you're 40 years old and you've never heard of it but you heard hear about it today it doesn't mean that you go, ah, fuck it, that's nothing. Yeah. It means you go, holy shit, I wasn't aware of that, man. They should probably teach that in history. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. Like, that's all that needs to happen. That's it. You know, black history really hasn't been taught in school the way it should be. Like, June, I, to be honest with you, I didn't know what the fuck Juneteenth was in, either right. until I went off to college and one of my friends that went to HBCU had to say, like, oh, it's, you know, it's Juneteenth. Like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. I, I never knew anything about that. And you're right. When it came to you know, when I was in real estate school and that 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 instructor asked that question, that's when it hit me. I was like, oh, my God, I don't know how well I'm going to do in this. I don't know shit about real estate. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I haven't even experienced it. And I already see just from how everybody else raised their hand that I am behind the curve. Right. I, I'm behind the, the starting line already. And, you know, throughout my career, I kept that in the back of my mind, which kind of hindered me in a sense because I didn't think that I was either worthy or I was good enough. Uh, to be in this field and in this industry and throughout life and throughout experiences, I couldn't understand why that is right throughout, you know, educating myself on what's going on. But yeah, man, people just, they, they, they were just, (laughs) they were just calling me all types of things uh, when it came to me, just uh, speaking my experiences, a lot of uh, other black agents though, to be honest with you, actually, most of them, was in my DMs was like, thank you so much for saying this video. I've yeah. been wanting to say this for so long and I just could not, I well, couldn't listen, find the words. So I made, I made the post about if you took the top five real estate companies and you go in their website and look at their leadership, zero black people in the boardrooms of any of these companies. Right. And so I made the post about that and I got a lot of people, you know, a lot of black people, black agents, you know, sending me DMs like, hey, man, thanks for posting that. Like, I was going to say something, but, you know, I don't want to come across like a crybaby. I don't want to cl- come across like I'm like, you know, like I'm bitching about something. And I'm like, you know, it's listen, I'm I lean conservative in a hundred different mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. And and I believe hard work pays off. Mm-hmm. But is foolish to think that we all start at the same point on yes. this race that we, you know, 
I think it's amazing that in a place like the United States, someone like you whose family never bought a piece of real estate, you never witnessed that. You said, like, fuck it, I'm going to go into real estate because my aunt was an ex in inspiration to me. You know, fast forward a few years later, you've helped dozens of people buy and sell real estate. Um, mm -hmm. And so to me, that's really inspirational. To me, that tells me, you know, whether our society is perfect or not, it's not in debate. It's definitely not perfect. Yeah. But we're certainly improving mm -hmm. because... In places in the United States, even in the 60s, it was still illegal for a black person to marry a, w a white person. So yes. let alone having, you know, a black gay agent mm -hmm. selling homes all over Central Florida at a yeah. really high level because you're a really high level agent. You yeah. know, if you look, if we look at 1.4 million agents and we put you in there and your production, you are pretty high level. You are at the top. Yeah. Yeah. And so to me, that's really exciting because one of the things coming from South America is like you don't see that kind of mobility. Yeah. Like in South America, you will very, it's likely that you will die in the house that you were born in. Yeah. And that house, it's likely the house that your grandparents died in. You know, it's, it's kind of crazy to, which is why I always, since I was a kid and I first came here, I, the first time I came here in 1990 for a vacation, I was like, I gotta, go, I gotta go to the United States. Mm -hmm. I gotta go there. Like I saw possibility. I saw opportunity. I saw hope. I saw dreams. I'm a dreamer. I dream every day. I exercise my dreaming ability every single day. Right. And to me, that's the thing that's amazing of this country. So we can acknowledge that that's happened in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, that you went from a time where your parents certainly didn't have that possibility to where you are living that thing right now. But also that things are not perfect, man. And we, you know, we got to get better at a, at a lot of things. And specifically in the real estate industry, 1.4 million agents and only 7% of them are black. That's a very disproportionate number to overall society. Right. For something that takes a 45 hour class to do. Yeah. So evidently there is another external factor that's making black agent, black people not want to be real estate agents or not really feel like they have what it takes to be real estate agents. Right. And then you look at the organizations that wield the power of, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent of all licensed agents in this country. And none of them have a black person in the boardroom. Not one. Right. And you I mean to tell me there isn't one that I would fucking put you in the boardroom of any of those real estate right. companies tomorrow mm -hmm. to share your experience, to share what your family went, went through. Because, by the way, they can do it from a selfish perspective. Having this perspective will allow us to make more money in the future. Yeah. But it's so removed. And I don't believe the people in there are racist. Mm -hmm. I just believe that it's just not even a consideration. It's such a giant blind spot. It is. And you bring it to the forefront and and it's then... It's met with so much resistance. It's met with resistance because I think they believe ad acknowledging a blind spot is acknowledging you're racist. Mm -hmm. And no one wants to do that. It's not... It's not racism. Racism in ignorance walks a very fine line, right? And it's just like, you have to understand yeah, they that. they overlap sometimes. They do overlap sometimes. And it's just like, you know, when information is presented to you, when you are pre presented with new evidence about what's going on to a group of people, I will hope, I will think us as human beings, right? And as this country continues to say that, you know, we are all, we, we, we have a democracy and everybody's created equal and fairly and stuff like that. You would try to say, okay. First, acknowledge it, right, and see what can we do to help. This is why, you know, the things that you mentioned earlier about me doing real estate on a high level, I noticed it, and I was just like, you know what? This is why I need to speak up and actually start to say things that other sure. agents are not saying. Um, because I, the first thing they would do is attack you and attack your numbers. You're not working hard enough, or you should be doing X, Y, Z, and blah, 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 this and that. And it's just like, are, are, do you mean to tell me that black agents are not investing into Zillow? Do you mean to tell me that black agents are not doing open houses, door knocking? And also, did you just tell me a whole race of people we're lazy? That's basically what you're telling me right, right now and why we're not performing the same way you are. And, um, yeah, man, it's just, it's, it's, <sighs> It was frustrating. <laughs> it, it is frustrating to be a black person in this country. You mentioned being uh, an immigrant and moving over here and just the American dream that you had. Us, I, I think, and I'm speaking for myself, but I'm pretty sure I can speak on a lot of people like me. The American flag and, uh, and America, the dream that America gives hope to the rest of the world is not the same for us Amer African Americans. It, it never has been to be honest with you. Um, and it's, we, we constantly have to take things on the chin and, 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 and just roll with the punches. Cause as soon as we open up our mouths and say like, Hey, you guys, we are being disproportionately affected by things, um, 
coronavirus. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. that was just a big eye opener. How it really affected the communities of color compared to other communities and stuff like that. But we are we are being affected differently than you guys are. You know, we deal with racism, we deal with police brutality, we deal with all these things, um, and w- we need for you guys to pay attention. Black lives matter, and it's just like. You know, no black lives don't matter. You know, blue lives matter. All of a sudden, it's like, no, what the? Listen, no, listen. We know it's a blind spot. We're trying to take that blind spot off and and educate you guys. So, I love, listen, I love what I do. Um, I I, I love being able to work with so many different people from different nationalities and backgrounds and stuff like that. I just want the people that are coming up behind me um, and, um, and, and generations behind me not to deal with the same thing that I deal with, the same thing that my parents and grandparents. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know objectively speaking, you've dealt with less than your parents and your parents yes. dealt with less than your grandparents. So that's the good news, mm-hmm. right? The bad news is that there's stuff still that we're dealing with. You know, I always say this in classes because, you know, obviously I have this thick accent, mm-hmm. which is funny that I decided to do podcast. That just tells you <laughs> kind of how stubborn I am. Um <laughs> But, you know, I'm a, I, I started as a buyer's agent, and a lot of what I do is call people that don't answer the phone and leave them voicemails. Not one person ever in my career had, that I didn't know mm-hmm. has returned a voicemail to me. Mm-hmm. And so we started trying it out, me and another agent who's from New York, you know, no accent. And I would call and leave a voicemail, and then he would call and leave five minutes later the same vo- voicemail. And they would call him back, not yeah. me. Because in people's mind, I'm sure they heard my accent, and they're like, mm. This guy just came off the boat yesterday. Oh, like was he a scammer? Like, what's the yeah. story with him? And so, um, I I definitely think there's a lot of things that we deal with in the industry. Um, I think black people, generally speaking, probably deal with it a little bit more, mm-hmm. um, or a lot more. I'm not sure what the range is, um, but I think you know, I, I think there is a there's a there's issues in the industry that are uh, more the perception and the experience that someone would have. And that's a very difficult thing to make other people understand. But then there's other issues that are clear, like the leadership on their companies. Yeah. They keep harping on that because it's so obvious. Yeah. It's right in your face. You don't like, this is not a perception issue. This is a statistical mathematical equation. Mm-hmm. I look at the, the liter- and there's no black people. Like that's an issue. And it, that, that one's easy to fix, right? Mm-hmm. Like we, we don't have to, you, like you don't have to enact a new law you don't have to do a rally you just fucking make a call and yeah. it's fixed mm-hmm. and there's resistance for that zillow yesterday zillow and redfin yesterday um i guess they had for th- they brought the first black people into their board of directors of any real estate company it was zillow and redfin yesterday i forget the exact article but it's basically that was the gist of it and i'm like that was news mm-hmm you know, like Zillow and Redfin bringing a black person. That's news. Yeah. In 2020, that shouldn't be news. Like shouldn't that shouldn't be, right? It shouldn't be. But you know why it's news? Because the rest of the other real estate companies haven't done it. Mm-hmm. And some of them are like, you know what? We're going to start. We're going to start this minority council. Like, no, no, you don't need a special group of black people to come to you with ideas. You need someone sitting at the table where the decisions are being made and yes. discussed, sharing in their experience in the industry, which is obviously very different. Yeah. And, uh, but there's, there's, there's resistance to that. There's resistance to fix the things that are obvious. And there's more resistance to even try to understand the different perspectives. Man, I, you know, doing this whole climate that we're in, a lot of companies are starting to do things just for, just for face, right? You know, oh, we... we Nike. <laughs> and you know I wear Nike all the time. <laughs> my, 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 listen, my friends and uh, some of my hardcore, like, you know, Black Lives Matter people is like, listen, Nike just is doing this for show. It's not for anything. But I respect the fact that they were one of the first companies when Colin Kaepernick, you know, did his peaceful protest and how he was fired and just, you know, met with resistance. They actually backed Colin Kaepernick. I respect that. And on top of that, black people are one of the most, uh, n- one of uh, Nike's biggest customers. Sure. Always I, been. It always been. So the fact that, you, okay, you're acknowledging that and you're doing whatever you're doing, I respect it. 
but just don't do it just for face. I, 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 you know, Target putting out their whole thing with Black Lives Matter and all these other companies. And, you know, I came to our own broker when this was happening because I started seeing other real estate companies do it, right? Mm-hmm. And um, we have a very diverse brokerage. Which the is, most diverse in Central Florida, man, if I had to guess. Man, I agree with you. I, I love it. I love it. it. Just being in the office, it's all of us, we're so we're from all different walks of life, and we respect everybody. One of my good friends is a Trump supporter, and I, I love him to death. Yeah. And it's just yeah. like, you know, I, I, I respect his ideas. He respect mine, and we continue on, right? But, um, yeah, when he when we came to, when I came to my broker, my broker was like, you know, I just don't want to seem like I'm, you know, just trying to ride the wave with everything. And it's just like, it's very important, especially running a diverse broker, that you speak up and let the people know you, the, the, a portion of the community uh, that's part of your brokerage that is hurting, that you see them, you wreck, you know, you acknowledge and your heart goes out. You understand what I'm saying? It's just like that 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 piece goes a long way because us as black people, like you said, whenever we go through something, we're, we're told to suck it up or we're complaining and all this other stuff. Yeah. We're not really meant to feel um, what is happening to us. So, yeah, I think, you know, one of the things is that, just like you said, I think in, in the case of our company, I... I actually got annoyed about all the emails that I started getting from random companies telling that me how they feel about race. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. if the CEO of your company make writes a letter to tell me that the company's not racist, like, what? <laughs> That's kind of a weird thing, man. Yeah. Like, I don't, I'm not interested in knowing, you know, how Target feels about race. Like, mm-hmm. I don't need to know. I'm hoping that you're, you know that your practices as a business, as an, uh, as an employer, are in, are in line with the values that we support in this country in the year 2020. And if they're not, I hope that you're held accountable for it. Mm-hmm. But I'm not interested in reading an email or watching you tell me how you feel about the racial tension in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I feel like I prefer actions I agree. over the words. And so that's where I, you know, I, I don't know, I think there's no right answer, but at, at least understanding that our brokerage is like you said most diverse um christ our broker is jose Mm -hmm. you know that's not exactly you Mm -hmm. know um he's had his fair share of having to deal with discrimination as Mm -hmm. well Mm -hmm. um and so um i i didn't feel like making a statement when everybody was making a statement was necessarily the best overall thing because it just seems so disingenuine and it's like um, it's it's what I was talking about with earlier when you asked me why I took a, a break from the podcast. It just felt disingenuous. If I brought you on four months ago when the George Floyd thing first happened, mm-hmm. I would have just looked like the thirsty podcast guy that wants to bring the black guy in so yeah. that he can get views because there's racial racial tension. And, and, I wouldn't it's, such, be, yeah. and it's such a weird, like so dirty, because all I want to do is talk so, to people. Yeah, and I wouldn't have joined, to be honest with you. A lot of companies have, have done that lately, have reached out to be, you know, we need for you to be our token black guy. Yeah. You know, and especially me. We need for you to be our token black gay guy. Right. Like, oh, my God. Yes, you hit on so many different levels. Yeah, it checks multiple boxes. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. You'll be so great, especially here in 2020. But, um, you know, silence is louder sometimes than not saying anything, especially when everyone, uh, all the companies around you are seeing things. And it just really put a magnifying glass on your place of employment, uh, employment that if they're seeing something or not. So that was the biggest thing. It's just like, it, listen. It did, but but the part where I'm like – Boy, it's so interesting to me because there is agents of all races in all companies. But like, for example, if I was in a company that didn't, that had hundred thousands of agents and there was no one black in leadership and I was black, I would be like, and I had hopes to one day sit on that room. I would be like, wait a second. Do I really have a shot at this? Yeah. Or, or is it built into the system that I'm never going to be able to get to that level? Mm-hmm. And so, but then people stay in those companies. So I'm like, I guess I get, you know, talk, going back to how humans are innately tribal, I guess it depends what tribe pulls you the strongest. Mm-hmm. And, and boy, our industry, our industry is so tribal. People in one company just flag the flight, you know, fl- they fly their flag for that company. And, you know, every other real estate company sucks and vice versa. And at least that's one thing I love about being in a smaller sort of boutique company. Like, hey, man, I think we're the best, but I think everyone else is 
whatever it's fine you guys you know you want to give your money away to a broker hey man good for you i'm exactly. not into that but <laughs> right me either you know i will tell you this uh throughout my since i first got into real estate you know you come up with your whole plan on what you want to do right sure and i always wanted to uh open up a brokerage you know every single like either mentor or broker that i was uh, up under they came to me and told me oh you don't want to do that you know you don't you, you don't want to open up it's too much work um, it's just, it's, it's just best to go ahead and hang your license just to become a hundred percent and just mm -hmm. have a team up under you. But then you look around and so many other either white agents or just in general, other agents are able to do it and they're thriving. Right. So it's just like, I noticed that sometimes us, we, we are, we are told not to do things and it's, it's unconscious. I don't think it's done on purpose, but I don't think people really value, um, the, the, our opinion in certain things or uh, to have us to allow us to actually have ownership and actually thrive probably is, which is the reason why you never see well, well we don't have any black people in leadership when it comes yeah to but i i think i think brokers generally will tell that to all their agents because they have a vested interest mm, i understand that uh, a vested interest in keeping them to not be broke and especially i mean i i saw that at my prior company much more than i've ever seen it before where mm -hmm. it's like people with gigantic teams they were like you don't want to become a broker i know you're doing 200 million dollars a year but you really don't want to become like like if that's going to be any more stress than managing 200 million dollars worth of transactions you know even when it comes to black teams mario like i, I do you know any top producing black teams here in central florida uh emmett combs is the emmett owner. combs is a broker and yeah, yeah good good point i'm so happy you brought that up because good friend of mine and my neighbor yeah, as a matter yes, of fact I, I i love him and i love what he does and all this other stuff and i actually brought it up when I was having a conversation with another agent about uh, doing this whole thing and they were saying like, you know, do you want to leave and join a black brokerage? I don't see you join, joining a black brokerage. And it's like, what the hell does that mean? Like, right. <laughs> what does that mean? And it's like, eh. and it's like, you know, what numbers is it that, you know, that black name, one if name, what they told me name of uh, black brokerage that's doing well. And I was like, you know, Emmett Combs, pull his numbers. And I was like, uh, uh. And I pulled his numbers and was like, exactly. This is my point about what I'm trying to make about how things are mis uh, how things are disproportionate when it comes to black people in real estate. Like if you're trying to prove a point that Emmett is not doing numbers compared to other brokerages and all this stuff, it's a reason why. Um, but like I said, I, I, I respect and I love Emmett. Emmett actually uh, emailed, he, he DM me and told me like, you know, after I made that video, it's like, I'm so happy you posted that. But it's like, this is a blind spot that a lot of people refuse to see. You yeah. Know, they don't want to see it. And a lot of other agents are telling me the same thing. Like Anthony, save your breath. Don't, don't, don't continue to do this because they're, yeah, not no, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in that, man. I think, you know what, even if what you were saying was complete bullshit, mm -hmm. even if all of it was, mm -hmm. I would still encourage you to do it. Yeah. Because you know what, when the biggest problem I think we have in society today is this whole cancel culture idea. Like you say something that hurts my feelings, I got to cancel you. We got to take you off Twitter, Facebook, can't hear you. You're unemployed. We're going to take your social media away. We don't want to hear you. Like that doesn't work. The only way you combat bad ideas is with good ideas, yeah. better ideas, mm -hmm. more conversation, more talking, more of this. Yes. That's, that's really the only way to advance, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and I think when people say, you know, don't don't put your neck out there, it's because they're cowards. Yeah. yeah. It's because they're cowards, you know, because if I had a dime every time someone since, you know, since I've been on my own, someone said, oh, don't talk about that. Don't say it. I'm like, no, you know why? Because if I don't talk about it, I won't sleep for two days because I'll feel like a coward and I don't want to be a coward. Mm -hmm. I also have learned, you know, with the years, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you, but not much, but uh, with years, I've learned to be a little more methodical about how I post things and, yeah. and I kind of put them through the filter of having a couple of people listen to them and read them just because my personality is very particular and I understand other people are not wired the same way and they may take information that I'm delivering much more harshly than I'm intending it to be. But I, I put my thoughts out there, man. I, I'm, I, I think it's important to do that. I think it's important for you to do that. And I think it's important for other people to to not be scared of doing it. Yes. Uh, because y it's a real problem if good people stop feeling like they have an ability to talk about the things they're feeling or their ideas or their thoughts 
because they're scared of the retribution that will come from the mob that's out there. Like, it's it's bad, and that's bad on the right, that's bad on the left, that's mm-hmm. bad in everywhere. Like, this whole idea that, um, you know, social media is just a bad way to communicate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is. Because you make a post, right? Mm-hmm. And then you're sitting there waiting for the dopamine hit when somebody <laughs> responds. And when they respond, <laughs> you're like, oh, I got to say something yeah. back. But you're like... It's not a conversation. It's not natural. Yeah. And then you're trying to say the most outrageous shit in the world mm-hmm. because your dopamine is by all those likes. And you're like, oh, I got 37 likes and that fucker only has yeah. seven likes. Yeah. I got him. Yeah, yeah, I'm right. I'm I right. I got him. Yeah. You know, and so that's social media is just a terrible platform to communicate overall. And so um, I, 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 I think in real estate specifically, one thing that bothers me is I feel like you're a misunderstood guy. You know, you said it to me, and I'm just like, how am I misunderstood? I don't, I don't understand that. I, 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 you know, the people that choose to misunderstand me is just they're, they're going to do that regardless, right? Um, and I've learned to not, you know, when it comes to sharing my ideas and stuff like that, not everybody is going to get it. Not, no, not everybody's going to get on the board, on board. And um, in other words, they're not my people. Right. Mm-hmm. I've learned to stop since cens- censoring myself in a sense, like I'm not offensive whenever I come and post up. Now, when I did do my video, I made a comment and I, I have a big sense of humor. Like everybody <laughs> knows that I, I, I'm a jokester. And I made a comment about, you know, a fat white realtor, like black clients going to a fat white realtor. And man, oh, my God. Out of everything Did I said, all video, the fat white realtors, I, the fat white realtors. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them had a great, instance, uh, you know, great sense of humor. It's like, well, sure. you know, I'm a little heavy. I need to lose a little weight, but I get your point. Yeah. Other people just hoppered on that, right? They did. Yeah. They, they didn't let go. So um, I, I went because you know what it is, Anthony. They don't want to. They don't want to talk about the substance, right? They want to grab to the thing that's going to get them all those likes, mm-hmm. which is that. That's just. That's fucked up. Yeah, it is. That's just fucked up. It is. So uh, to your point, though, I've, you know, we were taught, and I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of people of color, I was th- when it came to Hispanic people, uh, I one of a, fr- a friend of mine had to, you know, had to school me about, you know, when it came to this whole war on Mexican people, basically, in the beginning of, you know, the Trump era, build a wall and all this other stuff. And, you know, we didn't see too many Hispanics really speaking out and mm-hmm. protesting and stuff. And um, one of my Hispanic friends was like, listen, my parents always taught me to keep our head down, not really make a ruckus, make a noise because of the countries that we come from. Speaking out, we can be killed, right? And um, it's just like, we don't want to rock the boat or anything like that. And to me, it's, it's at, when, it, when it comes to where my platform, I, I, I've learned to be my therapist has told me, listen, you just when you put your stuff out there, just make sure <laughs> you're, you're very careful with your words because people will harp on that and they just they just won't let it go. So I, I, I'm putting it out there. I'm having conversations with people, people that want to have conversations, people that just want to argue and just refuse to see the whole point. I'm not engaging. It's just, it's, you just want to suck the air out the room. Yeah. And I and I think that's why I say I think. No, I know that's why I say that you're misunderstood because I know you. I know mm-hmm. you're a reasonable guy. Yeah. I know you're a you're an excellent communicator. So Mm -hmm. you're a person that's really easy to have a conversation with. And when people just see, you know, people, people's only interaction with you is in social media over a hot topic that really requires sitting down with someone having a conversation, not, you know, 150 character responses. I think, you know, people sometimes have the idea that you're this highly, you know, um, aggressive or conflictive guy that's out there just trying to troll people and i'm like <laughs> i'm like if, I, if I had the time. i'm like <laughs> you know that's that's not really you you're yeah. a super super reasonable dude and listen proof of it is that you and i are good friends we're having yes. this conversation i was extremely humbled when you asked our broker to have me speak at the last award ceremony and and you know that to me is more important than the social media stuff i i kind of like it's just such a bad way to communicate. I'm like, I'm doing videos, I'm doing my podcast, but I'm, I'm not engaging in comments and posts anymore because it's just bad. I just feel like it's 
It's the it's the uh, like button Olympics. That's what we're all competing for. It's and it's crazy because, like I said earlier, this is how we get most of our information, and this is how we share experiences. I actually feel like social media um, is the next step in human evolution. The reason why we're able to get so many things done and and and, and information to go as quickly as it as as it's spreading is because of social media. So yep. it is a good point. You're able to see the perspective of what Black people have been going through or any other race. Sure. Um, because of social media, we're connected. You you know my life. You you, you see, especially when I'm being authentic on social media. So whenever I'm hurting empathy comes into play and you're able to see that. And then it's just, it opens your eyes. Um, and hopefully in that change, but yeah, man, it, it is what it is. I, I, I think I've come to the point where I'm like, I'm just going to continue, uh, whenever time permits or whenever it is something that is on my heart that I think other people are not seeing, I'm going to bring light to it. I'm not trying to get into a debate or anything like that. Uh, it was a couple in Jacksonville, an uh, interracial couple. I don't know if you uh, read that mm-hmm. about the whole appraisal mm-hmm. issue. Actually, you did, because I put it in the, uh, in the uh, mm-hmm. Orlando Realtor Mastermind group, which is, I have an opinion about that, but I'll leave it alone. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I was just like, you know, I noticed that on my timeline on, on Facebook, everybody was talking about it. Everybody. People that was in real estate was not in real estate. It was just this hot topic. In the Orlando Mastermind Realtor Group, it was just really quiet. No one mm-hmm. wasn't bringing the points. I'm like, okay, so we're not talking about this today. And immediately I started getting an attack. And it's like, listen, you guys, I didn't say anything about it. I didn't have an opinion on it. I just said, we're not talking about this. Yeah. Like, you know, I didn't call anybody a racist or anything like that. And here I am getting attacked by it. But um, whether or not I agreed with what the couple felt, if it was racism or not, it is it is something that we have to talk about and things that we have to bring light to. Well, I think I think there's two things. Uh, either a you know, we need to talk about the substance of the article mm-hmm. which in my opinion like I think I made a comment like when I when I can attribute something to incompetence, that's my default. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't go to nefarious uh causes first. So I don't I don't assume an appraiser would be racist first. I would assume they're incompetent because I run into a cross. Yeah, I run across a bunch of incompetent appraisers very often. But with that said, it, whether you choose to believe that or not, at the very least, why it was so crazy to me how the the title of that article was worded. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, because it was like every buzzword to make someone in your position you know someone that's black in this country that's had a specific experience feel enraged about before even opening the article Mm -hmm. but then for someone that didn't have that experience they would read that and be like ah horseshit yeah and i'm like come on man we can do better like we 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 gotta be better at giving information like if the article if when you know when there is a shooting of a black man that gets killed by a cop Mm -hmm. like we got to do better than black unarmed killed by cops. Mm-hmm. Like how about we give a little more substance or make it more like man killed by cops and then people click and then people r- can read the whole story. But it's like, we want to get, you know, people that feel one way about the issue enraged and we want to f- make the other people on the side of the issue feel extremely validated. Um, without reading the entire thing, and that's like th- it's just a poor way of communicating. I I get I get your point. The the reason why I think it's important to actually label things for what it really is, especially when it comes to someone losing their life, is because this is something that has been happening since forever since Black people have been in this country, and it has the media has always turned a blind eye to it, or nothing has happened. When we Black people have not just gotten sh- shot shot since the Trump administration. Oh, Emmett sure Till not. is like uh, one of the most famous stories uh, uh, about how black people, black un- uh, innocent black people are being, their life are being taken away, right? So it, it does need to have a headline like, you know, unarmed black man is shot versus, because especially since the, the image that black people have in this country as super predators and all this stuff, we are always looked at as a, as a criminal in a sense, even if we are innocent, we're mm-hmm. the, the media or the, 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 the perception. Law, yeah, yeah. We're going to try to find a way to criminalize this person. So going, going back to the whole real estate article, one thing that really stood out to me. And like I said, over my experience is that I get what that couple went through. It's alarming when you say 
that when, when you get a, an appraisal that you know it's not like, you know, this is bullshit, especially when I know the numbers and everything like mm-hmm. that. And then what I'm going to do is remove all evidence of blackness, right? Mm-hmm. They didn't paint. They didn't do any major renovations or anything like that. They just took down their Tony, Tony Morrison, their Martha Luther King things and all this stuff. Now, mind you, it was another appraisal that came in, and we do know that appraisals are an art. It's not a science. It, it's an opinion based off of the appraiser himself, right? It can, be, it can vary from appraisal. But to be that big of a difference, and then we're also, in, in the comments, agents kept saying that I have told my clients to depersonalize homes and all this other mm-hmm. stuff, you know, take down pictures and everything. Yeah, but we really mainly tell it to people of color, like, hey, as, as soon as I walk in and I see a, a you know, you're about to take down You'd this You'd be picture. surprised, like, at least in my market, I have to tell that mostly to hunters, because mm-hmm. there's yeah. a lot of people that hunt around here. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, definitely. I know you love your... Dear trophies, but we get a vegan through the house. They're not going to be too excited to run into that. So we need you to take that down. And listen, I get your point. I, I full wholeheartedly get your point. I tell everyone to depersonalize from a safety standpoint. Yeah. Because I don't know what, because I don't know what creep is going to walk into that house and look at a picture of your kids. And then, yes. you know, we're off to the races. I, I'm like I told you at the beginning, I love a good conspiracy theory, so mm-hmm. I'm always trying to think in this 3D chess mentality. Right. Um, so I I don't know that there is more, like that, that's something that's get told to black people more often than to white people or mm-hmm. to l- Hispanic people. As a rule of thumb, I just tell people, get your, not depersonalized as in remove, you know, your heritage from the house, but depersonalized as in uh, religious figures, political things and personal pictures for a safety reason you don't want to have that but up. that couple said that they had to remove their heritage from there and we don't tell white people yeah. to remove their heritage from there you can have a picture of Marilyn Monroe on the on the wall and it's totally unless fine. they think the confederate flag <laughs> is their heritage then I will tell <laughs> and, then, and that's controversial right that's, that's, that's then you just have to use common sense so I it, I my whole thing about this whole it was the issue with the appraisal itself. Mm-hmm. It's just like this shit should not just it, it has nothing to do with the value of the home. Why the hell even when it comes to a hunter? Mm-hmm. Like just because it's a dead deer head doesn't mean that this house is not worth what it is because a deer head is hanging from the wall. Mm-hmm. No, so and do you add racism in it, which we have to acknowledge that racism is in the country, especially in the South. Oh, I'm sure, and I'm and I'm sure there's racist appraisers. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> there's gotta be. Racist there just has to be just just a, just as a measure of the size of the population, there has to be. There's racist everything out there. So the people that are in power are, you know, white white America is in power. We we know that, right? You look at Congress, mostly are old white men, right? Mm-hmm. Washington is made up of that. So and you add racism in there, and then you already have an oppressed group of people. It's kind of hard for us to be on equal footing. If the system itself, and this is where it goes into systematic racism, is in play, and we're not even trying to change that, right? Yeah, we are. We're certainly, uh, we certainly have different starting spots in the race. Like if it was, if it was a hundred meter dash, um, you know, it's certainly the average experience for a black person in this country makes so that they're not starting at the same starting point as the rest of the people to finish the race. So that's that's a problem in and of itself, um, and I think. You know, part of the problem is that we have, we've had the same political structures Mm -hmm. in a lot of big cities, inner cities for 50 years, for 40 years without change. And so one of the things that I challenge, I always tell my black friends and I tell my Hispanic friends is like, whatever you think about voting for, just think a little bit different. Think about it in this terms. If the Democrat Party already thinks they're going to get your vote, vote the other way so that they have to earn your vote the next time around. I think what happens a lot of times in this country is because people are running for the next re-election, especially with the black community. It's like Democrats feel like they already have the vote, so they don't have to do anything to earn it. They can basically neglect cities, neglect neighborhoods, neglect entire areas, and then Republicans don't want to try to earn that vote because it's a too much of an uphill battle. Mm-hmm. And so that's how you become disenfranchised as a people. And I think that's it's, it, it, it's, it's a dangerous place to be um, when, when one side relies on your vote without having to earn it and the other side just feels like there's nothing they can do to earn it. So everybody's just like, fuck it. We're not going to do anything about these places. You know, we're not yeah. going to go help these communities. We're not going to... 
um, go investigate, you know, what's happening in some of this, you know, whether it's the police departments or the hospitals or, you know, the institutions that are inside these communities. I, I agree with you. Um, I do agree with you to a certain point, especially now with this election. I think black people are, are saying, like, we're damn if we do, um, we're damn if we don't, right? But to your point about voting for the other side just to go ahead and put Democrats on their toes and everything like that, that can be very dangerous to us. Um, and especially when it comes to the administration that we're in now, I'm sorry. I, it, when it comes to Trump and all this other stuff, I, I, this, the, the whole protest and the uh, thing that was happening in Wisconsin and he purposely went to Wisconsin and, you know, thank the cops and everything like that for what they did, especially when a little 17 year old boy came and shot protesters and everything like that. Oh, he's fine. He's good. And continues to attack, um, you know, just the black community in a sense when it comes to us just speaking up and protesting um, in a peaceful way, to be honest with you, about the things that are happening. And it's just like, I think that mentality about voting for the opposite side, because that's what happens when it came to Hillary and stuff like that, has put us in this position now, you know. Um, yeah, I, I think there is there is a point to that. But I think when I look at the places where the protests really have gotten out of hand, which mm -hmm. is you know, in Kenosha, mm -hmm. then uh, in New York for a minute, and then Seattle, and then Portland. That's not even black people protesting. It's not black people. <laughs> and in fact, when I see guys like UFC champion John Jones yeah. going out there and grabbing this white kid that's smashing windows and being like, hey, man, you're not helping. Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. What the hell is that? And like, it's like the media is not really, it's Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is being blamed for it. And it's just like this I think I think you have a not small element mm -hmm. of of people that that are um, more on the anarchist side, yeah. definitely anti-Trump, but also anti-Democrat. Because, by the way, all these cities are Democrat mayors, Democrat governors, you know, Demo Democrats, police chiefs, Democrat everything, and they're still going to the. Um, to the apartment building where the mayor of Portland lives and trying to set it on fire. A guy that's more Democrat than probably anyone in the state and de demanding his resignation. It's like, what the fuck do you guys want? It doesn't get more Democrat than this one guy that's there. And so it's like an anarchist chaos movement. And then you have in, in a lot of these cities, what's happened is like what de Blasio did, which is we're just going to let people burn it out. We're just going to let people get it out of their system. Like, that's not how it works, man. Because the guy that breaks the window mm -hmm. is not the guy that's looting. Mm -hmm. There's a guy that goes in and breaks the window. And that guy is just like the look. agent chaos guy. And the yeah. guy that the people that are standing behind like, fuck it. I guess we can go in and take the stuff. And if you have this mentality, like, we're just going to let people burn it out. Like, I'm telling you from being in South America and living through riots for the last 20 years, 25 years, that shit does not work. It does not work. People, it, it will never get burnt out of a 17-year-old's mind or an 18 year old that can go in and grab some shoes real quick mm -hmm. like they're not gonna go and be like oh i, I got my shoes yesterday so i'm just gonna stay home and not go to the riots tomorrow right. like it's a bunch of young kids by the way they've been locked up for months in the states because of covid mm -hmm. that you know they're just full of adrenaline like i would have been one of those kids when i was 18 years old mm -hmm. 17 years old imagine 17 year old anthony Shit's hitting the fan. My mama will beat my ass, so I would not. Right, be out there. right. She will, you know. So how many of these kids you think have a mom that would beat their ass? But you know, you're right. But I'm gonna tell you this though. One thing that COVID has allowed is that we are also seeing the same thing when it came to white America, when it was like this anti-mass movement and this anti-lockdown, marching into uh, state capitals with rifles and stuff like that, demanding that they for public health. Like this is the main reason why mm -hmm. we don't. We understand that COVID is real, right? We know this, mm -hmm. and they are demanding because they would like to go get their hair done and all this other stuff, and they are doing the same. After a fucking football game, if their favorite team lose, they're tearing down the damn city, right? But when a black, an unarmed black man has been killed, and this has been happening for generations, and, you know, again, to your point, it's not really black people that are going out there to fucking riot and all this other stuff because we were taught, like, listen, you get in con con you trouble with the cops, you're going to get shot and you're going to get killed. Mm -hmm. Like, that's one thing we don't do. When we get pulled, we are taught from a very young age on how to communicate with law enforcement sure. because it can end our lives, right? And it's that's that's that serious talk that we have that I think that that I know that white people don't have or white America don't doesn't have with their families and their kids and stuff. So with that being said, 
I, listen, we know not to go out there and do some crazy shit like that because yeah. we're going to end up getting killed. Yeah. Um, so it's just a human thing that is happening, and I'm mad that the message is being, you know, is, is being covered up and not really being spoken and being accepted and um, digest because of looting. Like, those companies that are being looted the next day or the next week, they're back up and running. We have insurances and all this other stuff, right? And I'm not saying yeah, that. Yeah, but I don't, right. th- I don't think that's an excuse. Listen, I think... I think if you concentrate on the people that are resistant to it, like the anti-mask people, for example, mm-hmm. if you concentrate on those people, then you're certainly running into the situation where you're like, what the fuck? Just put on the mask. Like, yeah. why are we, why are we having this argument? Um, but I think, no I, way, b- friend. I mean, look at Florida. We opened up way earlier than what we should because of the pressure that we're getting. Oh, but we also have an incredible economy right now and people are living New York in the thousands. So, and you our know. healthcare system is like, uh, it's, it's, I, I, my fucking fl- my ankle, I think I twisted my ankle and I was waiting at a, uh, at a urgent care facility for like three to four hours because the amount of people that were coming in for either COVID systems or COVID tests. And one guy came in the same time, his eye was basically hanging out his socket and he could not be seen because of that. So it's like the most important thing is our health and it's not. It's, we're, we're, well, we're not able to attend to it. Well, and I, you know, I think part of the problem with healthcare is also the media has created this paranoia out there in a way mm-hmm. where you have people like, I can't, I can't go to the hospital because I'm going to get COVID. But yeah. you know, listen, I had surgery mm-hmm. w- two weeks into lockdown. Yeah. Like I'm fully aware afraid. of the. I was par- afraid for you. I was fully <laughs> aware of all the paranoia. I went to Health Central, <laughs> man, in an ambulance. Like, yeah. um, but you know, I think, I I think we are at a point, and my wife worked in healthcare right up until two weeks ago. But um, where the hospitals are, they are. They, I think it was six percent of the hospital beds right now are COVID patients. You know, they're getting back to doing surgeries for people, you know, breast cancer, my appendix. They wanted to postpone my appendix because of COVID. They're like, oh, we can put you on some antibiotics and we can see how things are in a couple of weeks. And I'm like, no, 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 let's get this thing out of here right now. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't want to walk around wondering like, oh, my God, is this going to burst right now? Yeah. Um, So that was the biggest problems. Like uh, elective surgery is a lot is a big income driver for a lot of hospitals. And when we oh, and what's elective? Elective is a weird word, man. Yeah, it is. Elective is is a weird word because elective might be elective to someone, but for that person that has that birthmark that looks a little bit like cancer, and they want to get it out to get a biopsy, that doesn't seem that elective to that person. Yeah, you're right. And so it's weird. It is weird, and it is. But you know, hospitals was actually losing a lot of money from that, and they were they were threatened to be bankrupt and stuff like that so yeah because yeah. hospitals are meant to run on capacity they are they are you know a hospital is not like okay running at 50 percent. they need to really have people in the hospital to be able to keep up with you know with all their costs all their doctors all their residencies and you know whatever else i running. think that some things in, in this atmosphere that we're in now things are too politicized to be honest for with sure you. and it's just like this is like basic human rights and um and things that that's what we need to look at it's not a right side or a left side when it comes to public health it's not a right side or a life or uh, 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 right side left side when it comes to racism and all this other stuff or black people being killed this is this is a human thing yeah but it gets knowledge you know and that's where the media i think it's a it's at fault the system that we have for the news media in the united states and the way they collect the revenue it's not sustainable And if you look at the human experiment, how long humans have been around, Mm -hmm. like our version of humans, I think language is probably about 40,000 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at social media, you know, if you look at it in the scheme of in the scheme of human history, it's it's a bleep. It's a nothing. It's like we've been dealing with this social media thing and TV and communication and electricity for a very tiny amount of time as humans Uh people still get burned with fire we had we've had that one for thousands of years people still get cut with knife we've had that for a long time my point being like i don't think we are at a point where we can say these tools are perfected right now Uh like we got to continue refining these tools and getting better and not being scared of saying you know the media right now is utterly worthless for the most part because all their their agents of chaos like it's so crazy to me. I just recently watched a show on HBO it's called The Swamp. Okay. And it's it follows some Republicans, some Democrat Congress people in Congress, and it just kind of goes into the inner workings of Congress. 
and I'm someone that enjoys politics a lot. I know more than the average person by a long shot. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning in this show that people in Congress, to be in a specific committee, they have to pay for that seat. So the committees in Congress, like your Ways and Means Committee, like if you have an accounting background, you would think that's a good person for that committee. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. It's not based on your merit and your expertise. It's based on your ability to raise funds for the party. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Ways and Means Committee is the highest, Mm -hmm. you know, because they control the purse. So to be in that committee, you got to raise some serious fucking money for your party and for Congress. And... The bottom one, you know what's the bottom committee in Congress in terms of money raising ability? What? Veteran Affairs. Mm. If you go to the Veteran Affairs Committee, it's because you have no ability to raise any money whatsoever, meaning you are of no value to lobbyists. Mm -hmm. Congress is here. You cross the street. The Republican National Committee and the Democrat National Committee have call centers Mm -hmm. with call booths like we have at the office to call donors and hit them up for money. What the fuck is that? Washington as a whole <laughs> is corrupt. That's this whole system is because money and big businesses are in there. And it's just even, I mean, th- j- Trump's a whole administration. Like we have people that are not qualified in certain positions. Bessie DeVos and everything like that. And y- even a, a fucking surgeon is over. What is uh Ben Carson over again? HUD. HUD. Yeah. It just it doesn't make any sense at all, and it's it's all it's all it's it's, it's it's this whole thing is just crazy. And I've gotten into politics deeply over the past year or two, and it's just like the more I just get into it, and I just see what's going on and the things that are allowed to happen. It's all about money. That's basically it. It is, but it, to me, it's so astonishing. Like people don't know this. To be the speaker of the house, you have to be able to fundraise fifty to eighty million dollars a year. Mm. I'm like. Well, that's a fucking problem because there is only like probably six people that can do that in all of politics. Mm. And they're certainly not the most qualified for that position. Yeah. Like if you have someone that is a very, a very qualified lawyer, you would want to have him in the judiciary committee. But if they don't have any ability to raise funds and you have a fucking guy that, ha- you know, had a peanut farm or, or whatever that can raise money, he's going to the Judiciary Committee, but the lawyer is not. Mm-hmm. That's super strange. Mm-hmm. That's super weird. That's super odd. You know, there's a congressman in Florida, Matt Gates, who is like laud as this Trump supporter, deep right, alt right, you know, like every conspiracy theory about this guy. When you watch this show, one of his closest friends is in Congress is Ron Kahn, who's a representative for California and has cons- a Democrat representative from California who has co-sponsored legislation with Matt Gates? you would never hear that in the news. Mm-hmm. Fox News is not interested in you hearing that Matt Gates has a Democrat ally in Congress from California, mm-hmm. and MSNBC and CNN certainly don't want you to know that Ron Khan or that Matt Gates might be reasonable enough to sit with a Democrat at the table. It's all fucked up. The way that we receive information is chewed and masticated it and is. vomited back to us in a way that is not real and it doesn't make sense. And it's, you know what, the real danger I think of it is people are going to be so disillusioned of it that they'll turn it off. And then we'll go from having people that are highly politicized, highly engaged on their tribes to people that just don't give a fuck. Yeah. And nothing is worth in this world worse than apathy. You brought up a, cu- a point a couple of months ago. You're just like, you know, our whole system, this whole two party situation is is we we don't think we don't think one way or another. We're we're humans. We have so many different thoughts and so many different ideas. And the uh, and good our, reflexes. Thank you, thank you. Our party, we sh- we should be a diverse party. We should have multiple different parties for multiple different ideas. And I think it was you that brought that up. Yeah, and I, and yeah. I, and I've always said actually. I enjoy the two-party system. I like the two-party system, but I like a two-party system where people are allowed to have different ideas. Mm -hmm. And Harvard did a study on this, and they've been doing it for like 40 years, where they asked 10 random questions to a a thousand different people every year. Mm -hmm. And it's 10, you know, some of them are just pop culture, current event questions, but basically it's the same questions, and they've been doing this for 40 years. And it's basically like, how do you feel about abortion? How do you feel about gay marriage? How do you feel about the Second Amendment? How do you, you know, like, it's like a yes or no. Do you think this should be whatever? And so it's 10 questions. And so if you go back to the, when the experiment first started about 40 years ago, you could, 
you could accurately predict if someone was a Democrat or, or Republican less than 20% of the time if you only had the answer to two questions. Mm -hmm. Today days, it's something like 87% accuracy with the answer to two questions. Meaning, you know, we've got, we, we're in the system that people either are in my camp or your camp or yeah. fuck you. Yeah. yeah. And, that's, and that's a really bad way. So what I want, it's, I would love to be in a point where we can be, where you can be like, you know what? I'm a Democrat and I want a candidate that supports these social issues. But you know what? In this uh, aspect, I'm, I see things a little more conservative. So maybe I want someone that lines up this way a little more conservative. But in the pol political world, world that we live in today, you are either a super fan of, a, of AOC mm -hmm. or you hate her. And there's no in between. And, and you can go down the line with everyone like that. And it's, I think, you know, you always, you know, the thing is always follow the money, right? Yeah. You follow the money. Who benefits from this? The news companies, mm -hmm. all these media outlets are making cuckoo box mm -hmm. from advertisement, from paper clicks, from podcast and videos and sponsorships. And it's like, you're in my team and I have a billion dollars. So fuck, I'm going to give you more money so you can get the message out there louder. And like, that's the people who are benefiting from this. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. That's not, that, there's no logical way to have healthy discourse in the climate that we're creating so you think that the media should be completely eradicated like not eradicated i think it should be completely um demonetized like i think you should have media and, and by the way i'm a moron so i haven't really given this too much thought but for example like twitter mm -hmm. for example i feel like the government there should be a u.s government twitter mm -hmm. that doesn't take any revenue from advertising mm -hmm. and it doesn't take you know it doesn't ban anyone and everyone has a right to use it. And that's the, 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 that's the place where politicians go to tweet, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a utility owned by the U.S. government and it doesn't collect any revenue. It's another expense. That way, you don't have a company like Twitter that can say, that can make money because there's politicians that are very inflammatory, like our president that mm -hmm. tweets and people are on Twitter all day long waiting for his tweet. Like, you shouldn't be able to monetize discourse. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think that's, imagine if we took what Twitter is and put it in the Victorian era in a town square, like the people used to have debates in town squares. Yeah. It will be a bunch of fucking assholes just yelling. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. it, it wouldn't, you couldn't have any kind of discourse that way. And so I think you take the money out of the press and you have a decentralized media mm -hmm. that is tasked with providing the most important informations of the day to the American people, unbiased, no opinion pieces. You, I don't want to. I don't give a fuck yeah. what the opinion of Chris Cuomo or Sean Hannity is. It's not interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Give me the facts. There was an explosion in Beirut and eighty-six people died. That's what I what I w care about. I don't want to hear there was a, an explosion in Beirut because of protests caused by the deep left party. Like, yeah, I get that. I get that. I think that the media also, though, the good thing about the media is that they hold elected officials accountable, right? If especially a good journalist or reporter, they're able to go ahead and get the facts and report the facts. And just like this is based, this person is saying one thing, but this is exactly what they're doing. This is what they're doing. And it's a way for us to educate the people because if we didn't have the media as a medium um, to really filter to, through and actually fact check things, the general public wouldn't do it. Right. Sometimes they do that, but the dangerous part with it, I think, is sometimes they willingly misreport an idea or a thought or a news because it generates revenue. Yeah, I, I you know, know, like for example, the perfect example is that kid, that uh, Nicholas Sandman kid, that had the mega hat up with the whole interaction with the American Indian in in uh, in the, the Washington Memo in the Lincoln Memorial. Mm -hmm. And it was like immediately all the media is like, this kid's a racist. He went after the Indi uh, after the Native American and he was yelling in his face and all this. And then the full video comes out and it's like, oh, no, it was actually the other way around. The kid was just standing there and the, na the elder, elder Native American came and banged a drum in his face. And the kid just stood there like a punk 16 year old would because he's scared because he's like, what the fuck's happening? And so that's why he got paid. He got paid. That kid got paid like in the probably hundreds of millions because the media gets it wrong because the media, you know, people have these preconceived ideas and anything that they can hold on to to um, advance that, they 
they just jump on it and they don't do the journalistic they don't take the journalistic um approach, approach. which it would be you know what before we report it is there any other footage who was there let's mm -hmm. talk to this person but that doesn't get you paid what gets you paid is having the story first first we reward expediency more than quality mm -hmm. and that's a problem that is a problem imagine if you could write a contract for a house and whether it fell apart or not, you got paid for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How many contracts would you write every day? I every I'll write I'll write a lot of contracts, but you know that that happens on both sides. It, it does. Oh no, one hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. And you know, one thing I can appreciate now, I just you know the, the book that just came out about Trump knowing about the coronavirus back in February, and he purposely got on the podium a couple of days later and downplayed it and all this other stuff and admitted to doing it. And it's just like, we would not have known about that if it wasn't for the media. If it wasn't for the reporter actually going through the journalists and taking the story and presenting the facts, it's a lot of stuff that we're right. Here but Right, the, by the way, first of all, I didn't think that was a problem. I don't want a precedent to be yeah. creating panic on people. So I'm, but the second part is, Bob did that interview in February. Mm-hmm. And now it's just not coming out. It's coming out before right before the, the election. elections. Money. <laughs> Money. But it doesn't mean that the things the things that were in the I, it, book is not you it know, does legit. it yeah. doesn't, but it just speaks to me like how much m how much important sensitive information that we should have today that we don't. Don't we don't have because someone is keeping it on their back pocket mm -hmm. until they can make October twenty sixth. Yeah. yeah. The week right. before the election. You're right. And that's exactly, that's the biggest, that I agree with you when it, it, this, like I said, the whole system in itself, from even the government to the media to even our ideas that we're so stuck in it and we feel like we have to marry our ideas. Yeah. And I tell people, I was like, you know, I don't think, we, I know I'm not going to see change in our lifetime. You know, hopefully our kids and stuff like that and uh, our generations after us are able to come and just make a better America, just like our grandparents had it harder than yeah. we did. Um but yeah, man, it's, 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 it, we just got to do it the best hey, we can and just be open. You and I, we're going to fix it, Anthony. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Thank I'll you so much real. for this, <laughs> man. You are an awesome dude to talk to. And I hope people get to learn a little bit more about you. And I hope you have more of these conversations and you'll definitely be back on this podcast. Yes, sir. I love you, Mario, man. I really respect Likewise, you. Likewise, if people want to uh, reach out to you and talk to you or find out more about what you do or buy or sell a house with you, how do they find you? Yeah, so I am all on all social media platforms, but the two major ones that I use is Facebook. You can look at me up by my name at Anthony uh, Bertram or on Twitter at Tony underscore the underscore realtor. Um, I drop gym drops, helping people when it comes to the real estate transactions and how real estate actually works. And yeah, or you can check out my website at BertramEstates.com if you're looking to uh, buy a house. But I know you're going to call Mario first. But No, 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 no. You <laughs> called this guy first. Thank you so much, Anthony. And uh, I apologize about the lights, people. We went dark a while ago, but the conversation was good, and I don't really care about what it looks like. I just care about what it sounds like. Um, thank you for watching this episode, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thank you so much, man. Awesome. Thank you. That was good, man. <laughs>